It is Saturday, the 18th of March, 2017. I am Robin Yellow, and this is Tectasm episode 48, Pay With Your Face. And with me again, because he is awesome, is James Woodall. Hey, Mr. Yellow, how you doing? Yeah, good. Long time since we've done a show, but we've got some fabulous material, I think, this week. Including, including Visa allows you to pay with your sunglasses. YouTube launches a pay TV channel and Google Home is in the news for all the wrong reasons. And we'll be judging these stories to tell you if they are a tectasm, which is a blend of tech for technology and tasm for phantasm, something existing only in a person's mind. So without further intro, let's get on with the show. The Verge reported this week by Chaim Gartenberg, Visa's new contactless payment card is a pair of sunglasses. Now, Visa announced at the end of February, at the beginning of March, uh, that they will be starting a new pilot program of contactless payment embedded sunglasses. Now, the sunglasses themselves, James, just look like regular sunglasses and appear um, to have a small contactless card embedded somewhere within them which will work with tap to pay now obviously you know we we in Europe use tap to pay a lot uh, perhaps less frequent in the United States so I wonder where they I assume they're running this in the US yeah it's really interesting this um, so effectively though the idea that you're going to put a contactless chip in other things is that basically the idea well, well, yes, and I think that's the tectasm. Um, we've traditionally, of course, just taken contactless in in a credit card size card with a chip in it, which we've used to pay, and that's everybody understands that system. But uh, but recently, people have been using their Apple Pay and Android Pay to use the NFC chip inside their phones to make payments, and that's moved things on. I think a little bit it means you don't you only got to remember your mobile phone. You don't have to remember your credit card, and I suppose this is a logical uh, extension of that. I suppose so. I don't know if I necessarily see the sunglasses as the way forward. Um, well, think about it, James. You're down the beach, as you always are in the summer. Of course, yeah. Um, and you've got, you know, you don't want to be carrying a wallet around with a credit card. You've got your sunglasses. All you've got to do is when you go to, to buy your lunchtime burger, mm -hmm. uh, bleep, bleep, get your sunglasses off, wallop. I mean, I suppose it does make your sunglasses a bit more of a target for theft, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think... The idea of putting uh, the chip on something that is on your person, like a band, a watch, a ring, something like that, which you're not going to take off or it would be hard to steal, makes a lot more sense. So I'm looking at this as here's Visa putting chips in other things as an idea. I don't necessarily think that this is the killer app, if you will, for a chip on an everyday item. Couldn't they just make a tiny, tiny credit card, um, which which is literally the contactless chip um, that you stick onto whatever the hell you like? Uh, yeah, Am I, mean, I being a bit, bit see why simplistic not. there? If you look at the glasses, I mean, it literally, the picture of the glasses anyway looks like that's exactly what they've done uh, on, on this it article. It does actually, doesn't it? In, yes, on the inside. Well, if you scroll down to the bottom of the article, it does say that the uh, card is a preloaded contactless card, so it's actually quite disconnected from the i guess the back-end service let's say your phone or your watch is generally paired to a real card and therefore backed by a bank if this is loaded it could be disconnected right a bit like well, what's interesting situations. about that is you go down to the beach you know what's the most you're going to spend at the beach or most you're going to need you take 50 quid so instead of taking 50 quid cash you use your app to preload 50 pounds onto your sunglasses and boom you're done for the day i like it yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about the sunglasses. The concept is great, though. OK, let's move on. Now, The Verge reported Ben Popper uh, at the end of February again, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Sorry about that, but we've been storing up these fabulous stories for you. Uh, YouTube, James, are launching their own streaming TV service. Now, YouTube announced uh, that they'll be offering a mix of live streams, broadcast and cable television programming. 
Um, the service will exist as a standalone app for $35 a month. So I think it's just going to be in the, well, it will just be in the US. And subscribers will get access to all four, four American networks, ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC. Uh, and additionally, 35 cable channels. Now that cost of $35 covers six accounts. So each member of the household can have their own personalized account that offers recommendations tuned to their tastes. Um, and you can watch three concurrent streams at a time. Now, this has been a long time coming, James. Do you think it's a good idea? Um, yeah, I think I think it is because they need to get in on the action somehow. And we discussed in a previous episode how adverts and YouTube are getting increasingly annoying. Uh, YouTube are looking to scale back on adverts, but they've got to make up for the revenue somehow. So the idea that YouTube is moving into a streaming model makes sense. The question is always about the content, though. YouTube um, sourced content is generally of a lesser quality because it comes from individuals. Um, so I think it's good that they're making it up with these major networks. But... Well, they for a long time you've been able to rent movies or even buy movies on YouTube. I mean, they've called it uh, Google Movies, I think, but they're all available through YouTube. Um, so you've been able to do that to a certain extent. So there has been premium content. But I think the YouTube brand is about homemade semi-professional amateur that sort of thing bringing in you know it's also they've got uh, that while they they will have um uh, they won't have comedy central or mtv uh, you won't be able to get cnn or amc or time warner uh, though i think showtime is available as an add-on uh, that's not part of the main service, but HBO isn't. So while we're saying it's premium content, you know, it's mostly network television, not the big, you know, the big nuggets. Yeah, which I think is a bit strange because, say, if you're living in the US, um, ABC, NBC, Fox, etc., they're all freely available on your TV anyway. So what's the added feature? What 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 do, what do you get here? Well, presumably you can watch on demand. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it is unclear to me whether this is a demand service or whether it's a live streaming service. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head a little bit on, on that. Is there any mention of when, it, when, it, when or if it comes to the UK? No, that hasn't been discussed or mentioned. Google have not talked about uh, deployment outside of the US. It's clearly a kind of experiment. Um, and you've got to remember, of course, they've got some stiff competition. Hulu, which is in part owned by the large TV networks, um, has a, a not only the live streaming of those channels, but also an on-demand catalogue. And Apple, of course, has been looking to move into this market uh, itself. So it's going to be a crowded space. I just wonder whether YouTube has thought we've got to get something out there. Um, otherwise, we're going to fall behind. I just wonder whether it, there's a bit of brand confusion about YouTube. It's you, you know, YouTube is a bit like Vimeo, or Vimeo is like YouTube in that it is for amateur, semi-professional content, anything you like, which is massively different to the professionally served market. I, absolutely, and what uh, what I'm struggling, I think, to understand is how do they plan on competing with the big boys out there? So. Netflix is clearly one of the major ones, and of course Netflix now has a lot of its own content. Didn't at the beginning, but it does now. Amazon Prime, same thing, a lot of its own content with a huge library of, of other things. And also they're now globally available. YouTube's a bit late to the party. I think it is, and there's some brand confusion there as well. On the technical side, which is where a lot of things start, I think, at Google, uh, on the technical side, they've got a fantastic tier one content delivery network arguably the best in the world uh, to deliver high def content to all four corners of the globe if there are corners to a globe um, and i think from that point of view you're going to get a good quality service so i would personally speaking i would look at it and say as a quality of uh, technical quality service i'm very interested in it in terms of brand you know, those brands are starting to form, as you said, Amazon Prime and Netflix. It's all about the premium. I just wonder whether the YouTube brand could stand having, you know, professional content streamed on it at volume and whether that wouldn't confuse it. its original goal of being a place where you chuck whatever you want onto it. Tectasm or not, James? Uh, no, I don't think so. You, you, YouTube will do it. They've got enough money behind them to push it out. I think it'll still be here in two or three years' time. Whether or not it'll be one of the big guys, 
I don't think so, but it'll definitely still be around. I think it's a tectasm, and I know it's very rare that we disagree, James, but I think it is a tectasm. I think they're going to miss with this. I think like a lot of experiments that Google tries, they only try so hard, and then they're very happy to just withdraw from the market. I think they'll give it 12 months, 18 months, and if it doesn't look like they're going to dominate and own it, they will withdraw from it uh, back back to their... Um, uh, to their base uh, and I think they're making perfectly good money from YouTube being what YouTube is uh, and I think they're going to stick to that in the future so I think this one is a tectasm. Okay well moving on to VentureBeat keeping with the Google theme Greg Johnson is talking about Alexa and the Google Assistant Google Home about the next generation of the features so you've got an Alexa I'm I sure do. you ask it all the time what the weather is uh, without looking out the window. <laughs> so what um, what this article is talking about is how we're moving on from a bot conversation to using these devices to initiate phone calls. So, for example, the the, the article discusses Alexa, call my financial advisor, Ooh. which um, is a phrase that I'm sure no one's going to use. But that's basically the idea. You know, how can you extend the bot interaction with human interaction and bridge kind of use the bot to bridge the gap between the humans and the bots which is very interesting now they're not talking about how these devices are going to replace mobile phones i imagine they'll just leverage the the call through the phone because it'll be on the wi-fi network um but um, um effectively it's another way of adding a feature to the device now What's really interesting is this is effectively Siri, just not on the Siri experience. On the phone, it's going to a device. Because with Siri, I can ask it questions and ask it to call somebody. As you can do with Cortana, Cortana and whatever the Google equivalent is. So what what's the point? Well, I think it's the it is one hell of a speakerphone. And what I mean by that is that the voice detection capability, it's got an array of microphones which allow it to directionally identify where the voice is coming from and just to focus its listening in that plane which means that its ability to hear what you're saying and presumably filter out extraneous noise is extremely good now if i'm in the kitchen cooking or doing something with my hands uh, being able to say you know call my mother uh, would be a fantastic double use of my time so I could be doing something else while fulfilling my obligations as a son. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, um, I think I think it's only natural that phone calls is added. I don't see it necessarily being the killer app for these devices, though. No, no, maybe not. Maybe not the killer app, but it's certainly um, technically possible, technically relatively easy and forms, I suppose, another step on the ladder of these in-home devices. They are at the heart of your family. They're right there in the kitchen listening to everything you say. So they've got to be bloody useful for you to get over the fact that they're, they're potentially quite intrusive. Well, I mean, speaking of in intrusive... Uh, something that's definitely not going to be the killer app is adverts served by one of these devices. So there was a video published by Bryson Muner who asked his Google Home device, you know, uh, what's going on today? And it replied with time and weather and basic information followed by, did you know that Beauty and the Beast is playing at your local cinema? And here's a bit of a synopsis of the film. So what this device has done is without asking... And from a completely different question, has fed you an advert? Right. Now, this is potentially an issue. So with um, Amazon Echo, uh, crikey, I hope I haven't triggered anybody's Echo by saying that. With the Echo, uh, they have, of course, got the uh, ability to take orders potentially for stuff. You know, order some sellotape, uh, deliver me a... 24 pack of nappies whatever your thing is um, and that's very clearly a a solid commercial connection for amazon it is less clear how google were going to monetize the google home so clearly what they've done here is they've dipped their toe in audio ads yeah and it's come up a massive cropper hasn't it i mean you you listened to it earlier didn't you yeah it's it's pretty intrusive and in fact more than half the video so 41 seconds uh, from 20 seconds on is just an advert and that's uh, that's pretty terrible i mean G google state 
and they told Engadget that it's not an ad, it's what they call timely content. Yes, I know. It's 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 partnership, it's uh, promotion, it's, uh, you know, insert euphemism here for advertising. Um, and I think uh, a spoke, uh, it, the, while they're deny first of all, denying that it's an advert, um, I think they've actually withdrawn it now, haven't they? I think they've they've ended the campaign. Uh, yeah, they they have they have withdrawn it. But here's an, here's another way of looking at it, though, James. So so the the I, what we're talking about the tectasm is running ads out of a voice enabled device in your house, okay? And that's clearly a tectasm. Um, and it can't be allowed, or or if it can, it's going to take a long time before we accept it. So I get that. Um, the question I have is that uh, maybe they were being really smart and saying, actually, if we do this on the Google Home, it will cause such uproar with people that it will make people talk about Beauty and the Beast. And ultimately, that's all we want to do is to make people talk about Beauty and the Beast as we are. Um, mm. And that's got to be worth $5 million to you. So, you know, maybe they did one hell of a deal with Disney in capital. They, they maybe always knew that the first time they did this, it was going to garner such press reaction that it would get everybody talking. And that, oh, oh, that full, you know, there's no such thing as bad advertising. You know, that maybe fulfills the obligation of what they were trying to do. Uh, this is true. I won't be watching the film, um, but um, I definitely see your, see your point. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a scary thing, though, the idea that these devices, because they are listening to you all the time, I'm thinking... Are they going to be listening to, in the same way that Gmail reads your adverts to give you related, sorry, reads your emails to give you related adverts, would Alexa or Google be listening to your conversations and then determining what adverts you would want to hear? Yes, and that's the scary bit. And that, I think, is something that um, is going to be a step too far. It could kill these devices dead. Uh, because you are, there is a bond of trust between the the vendor and you in that you take these devices into your house and you say, I will keep them here because they're useful to me. But if I think you're taking advantage or taking the Mickey, then I will I will stop it. Because of course, there's no way to put an ad blocker on a Google Home. So I think advertising on these devices or promotion or whatever you want to call it is going to come. I don't know. Uh, I think they're going to have to tread very carefully when they do it, though. Yeah, agreed. Okay, well, move on to a bit more of a kind of geeky, techy story. Um, in the register, Chris Williams has written about how Windows Server has been ported to the ARM processor. What's going to happen to Intel? So, effectively, taking the, the kind of mile-high view of this, generally speaking, servers today in the cloud or in on-premise run Intel's x86 chips, either in 32-bit or 64-bit mode, and they're basically the workhorse of the server market. Now, ARM, who are dominant in the consumer space, have been talking for a while about how their processors could be super efficient. You mean the, the mobile space? Yeah, in the mobile space. And they've been talking about how their processors could be really efficient in server loads and what Microsoft and Qualcomm have been doing together. And it says here they've been doing it for a number of years is finding a way of getting Windows Server to run on the ARM chipset. And this is for things like handling search queries, storage, machine learning, any kind of big data, number crunching tasks. So these won't be available to developers who use the cloud platform as such directly, let's say a virtual machine, but they will be used for some of the background tasks, which, you know, where from Microsoft's perspective, you need to throw a lot of horsepower at some of these tasks. So maybe ARM is really great for that. So what is the difference between Windows running on ARM architecture and Windows running on Intel architecture uh, in terms of operation? If this is something that's going to be put into a data center to do a certain task, as you've just outlined, then what is it that makes ARM processor CPUs more suited to those tasks than Intel. Yeah, I, d I don't, I don't really know. I mean, ARM have always been kind of on the power efficient kind of place, um, and uh, certainly companies like Nvidia have really been pushing in the AI and the machine learning space for ARM. So uh, maybe there's something 
about the way ARM processes its data, it's more efficient on under certain workloads. Right. Um, and now they were talking here at the top of this article about these ten nanometer chips, the Centric twenty four hundred system. Yeah. Um, ten nanometer. That's flipping small, isn't it? I, yeah. I don't know what Intel processors are at. Maybe fourteen. Is it? I think. I think they're. At the, they don't think they're at ten. That, that's that's for sure. Uh, and that, but that's what's interesting about about what ARM does. They release the reference design, but companies like Qualcomm really run with it. So. Qualcomm are not at the mercy of Intel to decide when to do something. So I think yeah. that's what's that's what's really interesting. I mean, you can almost build a a CPU just for Microsoft to run certain ARM um, tasks, which is something you can't really do with an Intel. Intel so chip. I think the tech tasm here is it has an Intel had its day in the same way that Motorola with its sixty eight thousand series has got come and gone and died. And PowerPC, that's the IBM architecture, has come and gone and died, though it may be still knocking around in the corner of somebody's garage. The question is, has Intel itself come to the end of the road? And is this the first nail in the coffin? I think what you'll start to see for the next few years is a split in workloads. So for general developer tasks, like hosting a website, I think that you'll see Intel still as the forefront of that, purely because software developers the world over will have to look at some of their code and maybe some things will need to change due to compatibility issues. But aren't you complete, as a developer, aren't you completely abstracted from whatever the CPU is underneath? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, there are certain occasions, I remember going back several years, the way the MIPS processor handled the float versus the way an ARM processor did was slightly different. And under circ certain circumstances, you'd get different results. Which I know <laughs> really? Was, was really... And that it was all brilliant. due to the way that the CPU handled float, floating point numbers. So uh, in some res regards, yes, you're absolutely right. But in others, you're not. And there's also the Endian problem as well. I believe ARM processors are both little Endian and big Endian, whereas Intel processors are just little Endian. So there's, there's some very... Um, there are some interesting things that if you're building an appliance like server, like a search, which only does one thing and Microsoft are the ones who are powering the code for that, I think that's fairly straightforward because they're in control of it. If you're giving that server to a developer, um, a third party developer, there's a lot more training and handholding that's required. So therefore, I can see there being a split for background tasks like search and storage, where it's completely abstracted as a developer, I think it's absolutely fine. ARM will start to flourish in that space. For front-end servers, I think Intel will remain there for a while, but ARM will start start to catch up. I mean, I'm looking here at some of these specs. The uh, Centric 2400, um, the, the SOC on that has 48 cores. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. Yes, it certainly is. So do you think this is the end of the Intel chip then running in the cloud? No, not at all. Uh, but I do think it maybe is the beginning, perhaps, of the entrance of ARM into this, uh, into this world. Okay, perfect. That's all for this week. Again, you can find us at facebook.com slash techtasm. Subscribe in the usual way and contact us at feedback at techtasm.com. We record uh, some weeks, so please stay with us, even though things get very random. This is me, Robin Yellow. And me, Mr. James Woodall. Asking the question, is it real or is it just a techtasm? Techtasm.